Chaiba is a longtime activist against hydraulic fracturing or fracking for natural gas in the UK. Co-founder of the anti-fracking network launched in March of 2012, he's led protests around the country after earthquakes near the first fracking site near Blackpool in northwest England created a temporary ban on fracking, but the Tory government lifted all restrictions late last year and fracking began anew. The day we recorded this interview, an earthquake of 2.9 on the Richter scale was registered in Leicestershire. Andy's graduate in geography with geology from King's College London and taught geography and geology for 20 years. He consults with anti-fracking groups across the UK to help raise awareness in communities of the potential dangers they face from an industry that has no known transparency or swift ability to react to calamity other than to protect their own interests. A Green Party activist and campaigner, he's been heavily involved in the anti-fracking campaign from its outset in the UK about two years ago. Andy Chiba, welcome to Worldview. Good day. Nice to see you. Nice to see you too, sir. Andy, Pennsylvania, with the Marcellus Shell Project, where a lot of land leases were entered into to actually extract this fracking gas from properties, is now very upset, we learned last week, that their gas is now being exported. And what most people don't understand is that natural gas and uh, petrol and all the things that we see, these are commodities that the prices are set in a world market. Companies make extraordinary claims about local jobs and safety and all of these issues. What's been your experience as part of the, the anti-fracking group here in the UK? Well, we're familiar with all of those uh, sort of myths and lies that we get from the industry uh, from, uh, from the outset. And I mean, the myths about jobs, especially here in South Wales, you know, you mentioned the word jobs and you know, it's such an unemployment back spot that you know, a lot of the, the opposition tends to melt away. Uh, but when you sort of you know, get into the reality of the situation, you know, it's short term jobs quite often brought in from out, outside. And, uh, you know, the industry's just got no models at all when it comes to sort of at every stage of the way. Now, when we talk about the, the industry itself, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, concern in the United States, other parts of the world about the water supply. And, of course, there's been a lot of claims made, and uh, you and I happen to see a situation here in South Wales where a uh, very prominent water provider suddenly backed away from being a part of the process because they now see no uh, real danger to the water supply. Talk a little bit about what happens in fracturing and why the water supply here might be at risk, not just here in Wales, but across the UK as these test bores are drilled everywhere. Well, in most most of the situations where the, the, they go for the deep shale fracturing, uh, you know, part of their case is that it's well below the you know the water table and the, and the water supplies, and generally you know they, they, they try and ameliorate opposition by saying you know you're going to have these boreholes caved all the way down through the aquifers and so on, so there's, there should be no real danger. And the key word there, of course, is should, right? Because <laughs> if it all went perfectly well, you know they could possibly be right, but you know, the, the track record of the industry is such that these bore casings um, are virtually impossible to get you know, gas tight in the first instance. Uh, any sort of earth movement, and that's the real danger of things like earthquakes. Uh, it's not so much that um, you know, houses are going to fall down, but it destroys the integrity of those casings. So that you've got a situation where, particularly when you're dealing with such high pressures that they work with with the process of fracturing, that in itself can induce. Uh, cracks and fractures and, and, and destroy the integrity of the borehole in its in its own right. And therefore, you've got a very high probability. You've got almost, I think that you know, the data shows that 10% you know, of these borehole casings are leaking almost immediately. You know, 50% of them are leaking within te you know, within a few years. And ultimately, you know, virtually all of them are going to leak eventually. So, you know, you know that is where you know, the issues of gas migration and chemicals you know, you can migrate out of the ball casings into into the water courses and, and aquifers. Yeah, um, you know, and and the migration not just of gas. We, we we've all seen the the films, and there was a there was a recent report on uh, uh, a national mainstream news outlet in the states, the Today Show, uh, showing what was also shown in the film Gasland that people are able to literally uh, set their water alight because of the amount of methane gas that's in there. Uh, talk a little bit though about 
not only the gas coming into the water supply, but the types of chemicals that are used in this fracturing process and what actually could happen if some of those also got into the supply. Yeah, I mean, firstly, you know, just going back to the gas landfill, I mean, there was a lot of controversy about the fact that uh, I mean, Josh Fox admitted that you know, some of the scenes there were not necessarily tied 100% to, to, to gas fracturing, because you do get biogenic and you know, methane gas getting into water supplies. And he, he, he took a scene where, you know, for, for good picture's sake, um, um, and it, 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 it's led to a lot of opposition to gas land, which is unfortunate, really, because, you know, you know the rest of that movie, uh, I mean, the whole of that movie, including those scenes, are based on, on factual instances. Uh, and just because he was open and honest enough to admit that he couldn't absolutely guarantee that, is something that the rest of the industry ought to be learning from. You know, open honesty is something which they're not very good at. And that's particularly true of the case of the chemicals that they use. Right? Now, a, a lot of people say in this country that we don't need to worry about that because our regulatory regime and so on is such that, um, you know, we're going to know what's going on there. But, but that, that doesn't hold up. Um, I mean, the, the range of chem you know, chemicals they use varies enormously from the different stages. It also varies according to the local geology and so on. Right? So literally every single fact job is likely to be using a slightly different mix of chemicals. So it's all very well for Quadrilla saying when they're doing a test frack up in Lancashire that they're only using three chemicals. Right? That might well be the case for that one single test frack on a, on a, on a vertical well. But when it comes to subsequent, you know, all, all, um, fact jobs and so on, you know, when they're dealing at such depths and in such co you know, complicated places that they're trying to get the gas out of, they need, you know, just the, they need these chemicals just to keep the drill turning. You know, they need it to, to stop things like, um, um, they use biocides to stop things growing in, in, in the boreholes. They need, you know, viscosity regulators. They need a whole massive range, it's well documented in, in gas land and various other places. And, and Theo Colborn, in particular, Dr. Theo Colborn, has done fantastic work showing not only the range of chemicals, but the, you know, the, the health effects, both immediate and long term, of some of these chemicals that they use. Now, as far as the UK situation is concerned, you know, you know, they, they talk about, you know, we've got the Environment Agency, we've got regulatory regimes, we'll, we'll, we'll monitor it all and so on. But, I mean, the, the track record already is, is pretty grim. They've only done a couple of facts up in Lancashire. The Environment Agency were brought in to, to analyse the produced water from those frack jobs. Right? And what did they find? Well, they found lots of uh, radioactive isotopes from, the, from things like barium and thorium that are present in the shale. These aren't things that they put down the well. These are things that come out of the shales themselves, heavy metals and all that sort of thing. The sorts of things that they're familiar with looking for, for from samples of water from shales. They did not find, you know, I've seen the, the full detailed analysis of what the environmental did, they did not find the chemicals that Quadrilla admitted to, to putting down there, let alone any chemicals that they don't even know about, because they can only test for what they know about first of all, so if they're not even bothering to test for the ones they do know there, you know, there's absolutely no way that, that they can identify chemicals that are not disclosed to them. Right? So, it's all well, well and good saying, well, the industry, you know, you know, there's law saying they've got to disclose what they put down there. Yeah. But if they don't, there's no way of, of, of disproving it. Yeah. And, and there's and, also no consequence if they don't either, right? Well, the consequences are likely to be you know, quite some distance down the road. Now, although you know, you, we hear stories about this industry lasting perhaps 20, 30 years or so, that's not borne out in, in what we see in, in America and Australia. The volatility of these wells tends to sort of go down, you know, like a parabolic curve really, you know, they produce a lot in the first year or so, and it drops off like, you know, very, very dramatically, and a lot of these wells are proven uneconomic and are being shut down after three or five years, right? Yeah, and, and we did see that in the United States where, you know, the, the estimates and the competing uh, uh, experts from uh, both Penn State and the University of Pennsylvania, uh, you know, one came out and said that it was roughly 10 to 100 times the amount underneath the ground than was actually there. So that's another. But when you're dealing with an industry that has such a, a um, bad track record of responding to disasters, if something were to occur in, in the water table, for example, I mean, we've just witnessed over the last week, even though it's not fracturing or shale gas, uh, there's an attempt, uh, the last couple of weeks, an attempt to drill up in the Arctic, 
and uh, two of the rigs, one yeah. a ship and one the actual rig, broke free and they weren't able to harness and control and get them back. Uh, there was a huge danger for a while of, of, of several hundred thousand gallons of diesel fuel on board the rig, spoiling very pristine Alaskan coastal waters. We've seen the Gulf with, uh, you know, the deep uh, water horizon thing. Uh, what sorts of... Uh, guarantees from the industry would be required to bring any sort of satisfaction to your group and to others? There's no meaningful guarantees that they can produce. I mean, you need to appreciate there's a fundamental difference between polluting a, an ocean and polluting an aquifer, right? I mean, if, if you go back to these places where you've got the ocean spills, you can go back a few, you know, two or three years later and you'd be hard pressed to know that anything ever happened. Nature's got a fantastic capability of, of sorting that out. Now, there's long-term implications for, for, for the biodiversity of the area, but you know, largely speaking, nature can, can sort that out given enough time. With an aquifer, you're talking about a, a situation where there's no potential for that to happen. Right? Basically, uh, in a lot of these aquifers, um, I mean, you do get some water flowing in and out of these aquifers, so there's a potential for it. To, to very slowly over a very long period of time to be slowly diluted and flushed out. But there's, there's no way, there's no mechanism that humans can actually do that. We can't actually rectify that damage. We can't flush these things out. Right? So if we contaminate an aquifer, it's effectively trashed right, indefinitely. Right? And th therefore, you know, in a situation of global warming, where, I mean, we already have a situation in, in the UK where you know, there's pressure on water resources getting to, to critical levels in, in certain parts of the country when we have just a two or three weeks of, of dry weather. Right? And we're going to get ever more reliant on, 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 on groundwater resources in the future. Right? So it's completely and utterly irresponsible, in, in, in my opinion, to be doing anything that can jeopardise uh, the potential of, of that water, which we may not necessarily be using like today, but you know, all the indications are they're going to be more and more significant to us in terms of the water needs of our country in years to come. And not to mention the increasing pressure of the competition, which we've seen in other parts of the United States. We've been talking with Andy Chiba. He's the Chiba, excuse me. He's the co-founder of the Anti-Fracking Network here in the UK. Andy, thank you for joining us on Worldview with Dennis Campbell. You're more than welcome. My pleasure.